And I'm going to begin reading with verse number one, read you a few verses of Scripture and give you what God has laid upon my heart for the day, hoping that you'll be encouraged. How many of you have been discouraged in the last week or two? Raise your hand. Yeah, about everybody, about what I thought. Uh, the devil, in his venture to sidetrack us and derail us from serving the Lord, will do whatever he can, whatever he believes he can, uh, to uh, make us feel like that God don't care about us and to make us feel like that we're a failure in ourselves. And in ourselves we are, but in God, in His help, and where we have the great victory that only God in heaven can give us. Hebrews chapter number 11 tells us of the great heroes of faith. And for so with, I may read you some of those. And then uh, Hebrews chapter number 12 uh, uh, tells us about God's love for us and, and uh, partially how that when God loves us, He chastens us. Hebrews chapter number 13 begins with brotherly love. And I tell you, it's, it makes a difference in my life when I know that I've got people that care for me and love me. And it makes a difference in your life when you know that there's others that care for you and that you're not at this alone. Amen? And we're not living this alone, friend. We don't need, never need to think that we're in this battle alone. We have many warriors to fight our battles with us and to help us along the way. Verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter number 13, Let brotherly love continue. Now apparently, uh, the author Paul here in his address is having, has had issue in some point in time with brotherly love, but not in this case. Because apparently these folks love the Lord. And he says, let brotherly love continue. And I say to you today in Gables Creek Baptist Church, let brotherly love continue. Amen. Just let it keep going on. And I have been around churches a lot all my life. Been around churches. Pastor and been in attendance at a lot of places. And I want you to know this is the best place I know of to be an example of brotherly love. If something goes wrong, everybody gangs up around them, comes around them and, and shows their love and their support. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. If opportunity comes and strangers come to the church, amen, be good to them, be nice to them. Show them brotherly love. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. And them which suffer adver adversity as being yourselves also in the body. What does this mean? Remember those around the world that are suffering at the hands of the enemy. Uh, persecution is, is uh, rampant in our world today among Christians. We haven't seen persecution in our country. We get a little upset if somebody makes fun of us about naming the name of Christ. But that's not persecution, my friend. Uh, when they begin... Uh, you know, when they begin doing here what is being done around the world, then we can say we're suffering persecution. But until then, we need to remember those that are suffering persecution today that are bound and in adversity. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Not much is said about being covetous. The Bible says here that we should be content with such things as ye have. Whatever God's given you, be content with that. If you see something, someone, God's blessed someone, and it seems like they've blessed them more than they have you, God's given you all that you need. And God's given me all that I need. And we need to be, be content with such things as we have. For he has said... Listen now, he hath said, who? God. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man can do unto me. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. 
Bless us now this hour, I pray, God, that the Spirit of the living God would move in this place. Lord, come around behind this pulpit. God, cleanse this vessel. Forgive me of my sins, God, that I might preach in the power of God. And I pray, Father, there's one sitting in our presence that's lost without you. I pray, God, they see Jesus today and come to know you before it's too late. Again, bless thy word, and God, let us rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse number 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken of you, the word of God, whose faith follow, consider the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. God is the same. Jesus is the same. And if he was the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means to me, my friend, that what he said in verse number 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, is the absolute truth. Amen. Now, I know there's been times in my life where I felt like God had forsaken me. Now, there may be times in your life when you think God has forsaken you. But we rest in the assurance of the Word of God that God has not forsaken His people. God has not forsaken you and I. He never has. He never will. Sometimes God lets us feel like we're alone so that we will learn to trust in Him and believe in His Word, and believe in His promises. Amen. So we want uh, to preach to you for a little bit this morning <coughs> on this thought. He won't fail me now. He won't fail me now. Now I believe we're living in the very last days of time. I get discouraged watching the news, so I don't watch it much. I try to keep up with the uh, current events a little bit, but as far as what's going on, it's the same thing over and over and over, and getting a little worse, more and more and more. But I know one thing for sure, my friend. God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is God's voice of promise. Now, what God says, friend, you can take it to the bank, so to speak. What God says, you can believe in. The truth in the Word of God are true. The promise in the Word of God are from the voice of God, the voice of promise. Deuteronomy chapter number 31 and verse number 8, we find scriptures that's full of the examples of, not, of God not uh, forsaking His people or not failing His people. And the Lord, and the Lord He it is that doth go before thee, He will be with thee, He will not fail thee, Neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. God's promises, my friend, are real. And he made this promise and God meant this promise. I'll never fail you. You say, that's Old Testament preacher. Well, we can take the Old Testament promises and apply it to today's Christian life. Amen. He will not fail us. He will not forsake us. The verse in Hebrews I, told, I read to you, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Joshua chapter number 1 and verse number 5. That, God speaking to Joshua. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. What comfort there is in the word of God when he promises he'll never leave us alone. Now, friend, I, sometimes I, I get discouraged just like everybody else does. Sometimes I feel like a failure like everybody else does. But I know with God on my side, and I know that if I'm following God, I know that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. If there's any distance grows between me and God, it's where I've left him. Amen. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's right there. In uh, First Chronicles chapter 28, David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee, 
He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. David could say this to Solomon because he knew himself the promises of God. He knew himself that God said, I'll not fail you. And he'd been through experience in his life where if it had not been for the presence of God, he would have been destroyed even by Saul. But he knew the promise of God. And he could say with, a, with blessed assurance that God won't fail you. And I stand before you this morning telling you that God will not fail you. God will not forsake you. God will help you to the very end of your days. Amen. How do I know he'll not fail me? Because of his word. Because of what the word of God tells me, he will not fail me. Again, Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. I know these things because of the word of God. Because of the many promises in Scripture, I know that He will not fail me, nor will He forsake me. God's there, friend. You go back and read through the Old Testament and read account of after account of God giving instruction to His people and then God helping them to do that which He instructed them to do. You know why? God never gives you something to do that you can't do. God never gives you anything to do that He will not help you and, and to accomplish that which He's given you to do. So, Friend, we know the Word of God and we know that it's true and we've read to you Scripture that God's not going to fail you. And I, I see discouraged people a lot these days. I see people that's just ready to give up. Listen, if you give up on God, if I give up on God now, what have I got to go to? If I give up on the Lord, where am I going to go? Am I going to go to the world? What's that got to offer me? Tried that one time, it didn't do me any good at all. What am I going to go to if I turn from God? And if you're here this morning and you're discouraged and you feel like maybe God's forsaken you, remember, He said, I won't do it. He said, I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. And God is not going to let you down now. He's not going to fail me now. Amen. We come through places in our life where it seems dark and drear. We've I've come through circumstances in my life when it seemed like I was in a dark tunnel and there wasn't no light at the end. But by the help of God and by the grace of God, I've tried to stay with Him, and it's not long till here comes the light. Amen. Here comes the help of God. Because I believe by faith in the promise of His Word, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. You say, preacher, I've got to see something. Well, if you live your life like that, you'll live in defeat. It's not always a life by what you see, but it is a life of faith. A life of belief in God, a life of belief in His promises, a life to know that we can step out by faith to do the will of God, and God will be there when we make that first step. Amen? I won't leave you. I won't forsake thee. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, I, me and my brother's pretty tight. We, we visit most of the time at at dad's house now we visit each other there and we see each other occasionally through the year and even though we don't see a whole lot of each other we're pretty tight and I mentioned this at the funeral we're, to, we're you know we're pretty tight as brothers but Jesus is one that sticketh closer than a brother and I could call on my my brother I could call on him right now and he'd do anything he could for me and I would him and if that's be the case Humanly and naturally, how much more it is when Jesus said that he'd be closer to us than our brother. Amen? God's not going to leave you now. God's not going to forsake you now. He never has once forsaken one of his own. Never once has he turned his back on his children. Living and serving God and doing the will of God. 
Say, preacher, but I'm such a failure. Listen, if you're doing what God wants you to do, there is not a failure in this building. Amen. You say, but preacher, I don't do anything. I'm not doing anything for the Lord. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you being faithful here at the house of God? Are you being in church when God says to be in church? Are you trying your best to live and serve Him? You're, listen, God's not going to forsake you. You're doing what God wants you to do. You're not a failure. Some of the greatest people I've known never, never had a, a, a big voice in church. Uh, may never do anything that we consider extraordinary, but I'll tell you something. God's called me to preach, and I'll do it till my last breath. If God will help me to do it, and He will. And I'll preach till my dying day. But I'll tell you something. When I get to glory, I'm going to be way back in the line when it comes to the crown and rewards of some people that have seemingly not did anything, but they've prayed, and they've prayed for me, and they've helped me, and they've helped you. And when someone said, please pray for me, they've not just nodded their head and said yes, but they've got before God and prayed for you. Friend, I'm telling you, he won't leave you nor forsake you. And if you feel like you're not doing anyone any good, God's not going to fail you. Do what he wants you to do. Serve the Lord with gladness. Pray God's blessings and pray God would help those around you. Do the will of God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we see this all in the examples and the, and the verses of Scripture in the Word of God that promises He won't fail us. Now let me give you just a few examples in Scripture. Some of them we've already mentioned of God not failing His people. We say, say, first of all, Abraham. He promised Abraham, he said, I'll make of thee a great nation. And we see that in the nation of Israel today. Did God forsake to fulfill the promise that he promised to Abraham? No. Why? Because he'll not fail you now. We see David. David was a man of battle. He couldn't build, he couldn't build the house of the Lord because he was a man of, of, of battle and he was a warrior and, and uh, God did not that was a good thing in David's life but God didn't use him because of that but God used David in many many ways what do you think little David must have thought when he stepped before that giant and God said you can do this by the help of God you can do this by my help you can do this and God and David with great with great courage in his heart stood before Goliath believing in the promise of God because of the things of the past in his life that he'd experienced he stood before that giant and he slew him like God said he would do did God fail him then no was that something that looked like that he could do on his own no it only had to be by the power of God that he would survive such as that but God didn't fail him we see that in the life of Abraham, in the life of David. We see that God did not fail Daniel. Oh, Daniel, you know, he had, a, he had a habit of praying under the Lord. I wish we could develop that habit of prayer. Amen? And it was a good habit. And three times a day, David, Daniel would pray. In the morning, he'd get up, he'd have prayer meeting. Come dinner time, he'd have prayer meeting come supper time he'd have prayer meeting and it got to getting on the king's nerve got to getting on people's nerve and they went and said listen we need a decree from you O king that Daniel's got to quit this praying to that God he's praying to now what if somebody comes to you and says you're going to have to quit praying what are we going to do we're going to change our method of praying. If you've been known to, to pray and pray out loud and, and people hear you pray and then somebody comes and says, you're going to have to quit praying out loud, are we going to submit to that? Are we going to go silent in our prayer? Are we going to follow the Lord or follow man? Daniel determined in his heart, I'm not going to follow this. I'm going to go about my business and let God handle the rest of it. So they made the decree that Daniel couldn't pray Daniel went as he did aforetime. He got, he got down before the wind and before God, 
and begin to cry out aloud to the God of heaven. And of course they took Daniel because he defied the king's decree and they cast him into a den of lions. Not a lion's den, but a den of lions. They cast him into there and the next morning the king was up early to see if Daniel had survived. And Daniel had survived. Why? Because he did what God wanted him to do and he believed in the promises of God and I believe Daniel said, throw me in there. If they eat me, I'll be in glory. If they don't, I'll serve him anyway. Amen. So we see these examples in Scripture. And Joshua had the promise of victory in Canaan. And Moses handed the mantle over to him. <clears throat> and God gave him the promise that he wouldn't fail him nor forsake him. And he was allowed to lead the children of Israel over into Canaan by the help of God. Did God fail him? Did God forsake him? No. Was there battles? Yes, there was. But God helped him to win the battle because of his promise. Moses had the provision of the Israelites. For 40 years, God said, you know, that they won't go hungry and their shoes and clothes won't wear out. Is that humanly possible to us? No. But with God, all things are possible. And God didn't fail them. God didn't forsake him. You say, preacher, this happened a long time ago. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not fail me now. Amen. God won't fail you. Noah had the promise of, of preservation for his family and anyone else that would listen to the message. Noah built that ark 200 years ago. Noah built that ark, and when he got finished, he preached the message of salvation, get on the ark, get on the ark. They laughed at him, made fun of him, but he and his family got on the ark and they were saved because they believed God. Humanity would have, have lost if Noah hadn't have believed God and trusted God, but Noah believed and trusted God. God said, no, I won't fail you nor forsake you. Don't you know those were dark days for Noah? So he built that ark. We often forget the lesson after he built the ark and got his family on the ark. But how would you like to be on a world covered with water? You ever thought about that? I've been out in the ocean, deep sea fishing, and look all around and you can't see anything but water. Nothing but water. And from out there it seemed to me like I was down in a bowl and the water was up all the way around me. And I look and look, and, and, and I was young then, and I looked and I tried to see something out there on the horizon. There was nothing to see. And I began to think, what would it be to be like that on the water, knowing that that was all that was there for you? You think you wouldn't have to trust God? There you are, responsible for your family and all those animals. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And all that time, Moses trusted the Lord. And God didn't fail him. God, you know, that, that place had to start stinking after a while. Don't you think? Unless God just took a stink out of all of it. And, and who was it said, he wished, wished Noah had swatted the two mosquitoes. Done, done away with it. But you know, it had to, God had to be with him more than just preservation of life. God had to help him every day and encourage him every day. No, I know it seems like there's nothing, but you're all right. Your family's all right. I'm taking care of you. Wait till you see the land. So one day, Noah got a glimmer of hope. And that little dove went out and brought back an olive leaf. Plucked in his mouth. I, I, I guarantee you, Noah got up and run and bit little olive leaves and said, Look, Mama, look, 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 look what the bird brought back. And I believe the first day when the bird didn't bring nothing back, Noah said, Oh, no. God, have you forsaken me? God, have you, have you let me down? And God said, No, Noah, I've not let you down. 
sent out that bird again that come back that olive leaf. Now, I probably think he did a dance. Hallelujah. There's something green sticking up somewhere. There must be some land someplace. Waited a little while longer and sent that little bird out. That little bird didn't come back. That little bird didn't come back because it had found a place to rest. Oh, friend, today I'm telling you, God in heaven, no matter how bleak it may seem to you, no matter how dark it may seem to you, he said, I will not fail you, and God's not going to fail you now. Even seems the waters may overflow, God's not going to fail you now. I'm hurrying. Noah, Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem by the help of God. He had to rebuild the, the he had to rebuild those walls that had been torn down. Guess what? God helped him. An impossible task. But God gave him strength and God gave him courage. You say, preacher, that's something natural. God will help you. Whatever it is, God will help you. He'll not fail you nor forsake you. Going to the New Testament, we see a man named John that preached the gospel that preached the message of repentance in a day when it was very unpopular to preach a message of repentance. Kind of like it is today. It's pretty unpopular if you preach a message of repent from your sins. But still it is the truth of the scripture. You must repent of your sins if you're going to go to heaven to be with the Lord and to be with your family. You must repent. John preached that message of repentance with the power of God in a day when it was not popular, but God was with him, God promised him, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And we find it all the way into the New Testament in John's life where he preached with the power of God. Later gave his life for that, but God was with him to the very end. We see Paul, the great evangelist that evangelized and started many churches because he believed that God wouldn't fail him nor forsake him. Paul's life is, is very unique because he started out exactly the opposite of what he finished. He started out persecuting, ended up praising the Lord. Amen? He will not fail you nor forsake you. What about Stephen that preached the gospel? What about Stephen that was... Well, that was there, and he, he was the first one to go out as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ because he wouldn't quit preaching Jesus. What are you going to do in this day that we live in? Should it come to the place where you have to deny Christ or be, be put to death? What are you going to do? Well, tell you what, I don't know. I know what I want to do, and by the help of God, I'll do it. God's grace will be sufficient for me to say, do what you got to do. I'm going to stand for the Lord. So I don't know what I'd do for I know. But God's grace will be there when you need Him. Stephen died for his faith, but God never left him nor forsook him. He's not going to start with me and you. We see all these examples. We read all this scripture. And we know that God's not going to fail us now. God's not going to start with me. Neither is he going to start with you. Now, the devil have you believe that. I don't know the times I've been in dark places that the devil didn't say, now where's your God? You look at the devil and say, he's right here. You go away and mind your own business. My God's right here. He said he wouldn't leave me nor forsake me. And even though I may not feel him, I know because of my faith and because of my belief, I know that God is with me. Even though I don't feel it, I know he's there. How do I know he's there? Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Old friend, you don't base anything you do on feelings. You base it on faith. Don't base your salvation on your feelings. You base it on your faith in the word and the promises of God. If you feel down and out and discouraged, amen, remember, the promise of God is I will not fail you nor forsake you. No matter what you're facing, if you're facing sickness, God said, I will not fail you nor forsake you. You can believe that. If you're facing heartache, 
God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. You can believe that. Many have faced as late as of lately, many have faced pain. Physically and mentally and emotionally, God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. And his promise is real. He never has left us or forsaken us. Forsaken us. One of them's right. But no matter how you say it, it's, it's true. God ain't going to fail you. Amen? He's not going to fail me and he's not going to start now. God will not fail me now. And I come to this last one, the point that I couldn't have preached and known anything about last week much, but I know it now. He won't fail you when death comes your way. He's not going to fail you. I, last Sunday morning, I, I knew Mama was leaving this world. I didn't know when, but I knew she was leaving this world. I done told two or three people, this is it, mom's, mom's leaving, but I didn't know when. And I had the best times with my mama that Sunday afternoon that I could ask for. She encouraged me, she encouraged everybody that come in that room, that spoke to her, she encouraged them. I put her on, uh, uh, I got a nephew that couldn't get here from California, his wife uh, she's going to have a baby and she couldn't travel and he didn't want to leave her and so I got him on the phone and got her on the phone with him and, and put it on FaceTime thank God for modern technology and they looked at each other and saw each other and told each other they loved him and I'm telling you what I never heard my mama say one discouraging word while she lay on her deathbed not a complaint not one time did she say oh I the only thing she was concerned about was daddy and she said, now you make sure he eats, and you make sure this, and you make sure that, and uh, you know, take care of him, and, and all of it. But she never one time said, oh, no, I'm dying. Not a complaint. I was there. I listened. I watched for things. I didn't know one time say, I'm... See, now, I didn't know all of that before this week. I've been around people when they passed away, but I'd never been there that long to... And them conscience and no, mama was not under the influence of drugs. When she'd have a little problem breathing, they would give her just a little bit of morphine, but it did not take her out of her senses. And that's when I, you know, I, mama knows. The doctors come in there and people from hospice come in there and they say, look, uh, we're the comfort team. I said, y'all do your best. I didn't tell them that, but I said, y'all do your best. Mama's already got what she needs, but y'all do your best. And they go in there and say, now, do you want us to tell you straight, or do you want us to, Mama say, you tell me what's going on. And they said, ma'am, well, you know, this is what's going to happen. This is what, you know, you'll, uh, your, your breathing's not good, and, and uh, you're going to have, you know, trouble breathing, and you're, this is going to that, and that's going to that. And uh, you probably maybe just go to sleep and not wake up. But we're going to do all we can to keep you comfortable. Talking about give her drugs. And Mama said, okay. And every one of them doctors walk out of there doing this. Well, one of them got out real quick, and I knew that he was disturbed. I felt like he was disturbed over something. So I run him down the hall, and I stopped him, and I said, I, I appreciate your candidness. And your willingness to tell us exactly what's going on. He says, she's taking that awful good. She said, I ain't never seen anybody this calm. There she's going to die. I've not ever seen anybody this calm. I said, friend, I said, let me tell you something. She's going to a far better place than this. And he said something about a higher power. And I said, look. I said, what I'm telling you right now is real. I said, when she leaves this, she's going into the presence of the Lord. And we're not worried because we know that we'll see each other in another day. We'll see each other again. And he still walked off scratching his head. But one time, amen, I got a chance to tell somebody that there's something after this. Hallelujah to God. I stood around there and watched Mama and... Uh, she had her oxygen on. They had her on 100% oxygen. And her oxygen level was hanging around 70. That's how bad off she was. 
I asked her one time, and I told this, I believe, earlier. I said, Mama, is there anything particular you want me to say? I always ask people if I can, if there's something on their mind they want me to do. She raised up in the bed, just raised her head up, looked me dead, and I said, you preach Jesus. I said, well, that's pretty easy. Amen, I do that. And then she called to my brother around, me around. We got and said, now here's what I want to be buried in. She said, it's hanging in the car. Had all of it fixed up. Everything was fixed up. All of it. And, uh, uh, we, you know, we got everything else together. She had all that fixed up and ready to go and check out and just ready to go. Just waiting like she's standing at a bus stop waiting for the bus to come. Hallelujah to God. And I stood around there waiting with Mama. And, I, of course, we didn't have church in about 10, about 10 o'clock. She was laying over there asleep. She asked, asked Hilda. She was with me, my, my cousin. She said, I need to be turned over just a little bit. Can you get them to turn me over? Wide awake. In her right mind. She said, Preacher, why ain't you bawling your eyes out telling it? Because I'm not going to miss her long. Hallelujah to God. And so they come in there and turned her over on her side. I'm telling you, about 20 or 30 minutes late, later, I started out the door. I said, well, I'm going to go home. I'll be back in the morning when they take her to the hospice. And I about knew they weren't going to, but I thought, well, you know, so I picked up my stuff, started out the door, looked over at the monitor, and it went to doing this. Walked back over, put my stuff down, walked over there to Mama, and she was breathing. I pat her on the cheek, Mama, wake up, Mama. My cousin come over there, pat her on the cheek, wake up, pat her on, no. Nope. About three more times she breathed. I done pushed the button and called them in there. They come in there, I went up the door, I said, she's gone. So they laid her back. She had to do not resuscitate. She won't know that. No part of that. She wants to go to heaven. She don't want no chance of coming back here. Amen. So they laid her back. And I, you know, I knew she knew Mama's gone. And uh, one of them said, the other said, "You call it, call the time." And they did. And uh, I looked at my cut. I said, "She's gone. She's gone." You know what? You know what happened right then? God's grace flooded that room, and hallelujah to God, it's just about as I could see her being escorted into glory. Hallelujah. And just a minute later, Mama wasn't there. Mama was in heaven. And hey, man, we're left to carry on till she comes back, or till Jesus comes back and takes us to be with her. Amen. Now, that's a sad occasion, a sad time, because I was left with a with the duty of calling everybody and telling them what happened. I called my dad, told him, and somebody went and got him, brought him up there and called my daughter, and she came up there and, and called my brother, and he came up there. And we sat around there, and here come the chaplain, and the chaplain was there when I got back from bringing somebody upstairs. And uh, I don't think she really understood what was going on because we go, you know, we just wasn't, we was tore up. But God's grace was real. We were in tears, but God's grace was sufficient. Amen. And it will be when I go. Hallelujah. It will be when you go. Praise the Lord. God will be with you. He will not fail you even when it comes to the point of dying. God will be with you. And I've seen that more and more times. God is with God's people die well. One of them folks was telling her that she might die while she was asleep. Mama said, boy, that'd be a way to go. I'm telling you, I've been, never been around nothing like it in my life. And that's exactly what God let her do. Went to sleep, just didn't wake back up on this side. Amen. Oh, what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. And I know Mama was looking forward to seeing him most of all. God will not fail you. He's not going to fail me now. Amen. He's not going to fail you now. Whatever you're going through, God's not going to fail you. Whatever distress you're being uh, hit with right now, God is not going to fail you. He said, I will be with thee. Even to the end of the earth, he said, I will be, I will be with you. What a promise. What a promise. Do you know the Lord today? Do you know him? If it comes your time to die today, oh, preacher, it ain't going to be my time today. How do you know? How do you know it's not going to be your time to go today? 
Ain't nobody in here promised you're going to live the next minute. What if I go today? God's going to be with me. I know it. God's going to be with me. If you go today, is God going to be with you? If you're saved, you will be. But if you're lost, you're on your own, friend. How sad that is to die lost without God and not have God there to meet you. To be cast into the lake of fire or into hell and soon into the lake of fire. I wouldn't change it, friend. If I said none of the sound of my voice and had any doubt whatsoever that I wasn't saved and wasn't right with God, I'd make sure before I left here today that I knew where I was going when I left this world. Because there's nobody or no thing worth dying and go to hell over. Nobody. Nothing. Not to life that you think you're going to live if if you don't, if you get saved, you're going to have to change your lifestyle. It'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. And if you think and listen to the devil and say you're going to have to give up all your worldly pleasures, you will, amen, but it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you you can't have fun as a Christian. I have fun, amen. I enjoy life better than the lost man ever thought about it, Hallelujah. But it's all because of Jesus. He will not fail you nor forsake you. If you don't know God today, friend, I'm going to tell you just as plain as I can tell you, you're going to go to hell without God and there will be no hope after you breathe your last breath. No chance for you. I don't care how good a person you've been. I don't, how good a, don't care how good a person you are. I don't care how good moral standards you are, how many churches you've got your names on their books. If you're not saved, you're going to hell without God. Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for the word of God today. Bless us, I pray. Help us now in the altar call in Jesus' name. Amen. While every head's bowed, no one looking. I wonder if you're here today. And you say, preacher, I have never been saved. I never remember a time in my life when I bowed before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or Jesus, will you save me? I want to pray someone raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell.